okay. As we begin wrapping up Aenith Deepkin Week in the lore, we're going to take a look at the Asharans today. Sometimes pronounced Isharans, it depends, I'm going to go with Asharans. Now, when we talk about these, we're going to talk about all of them, not only the ones related to raiding. Uh, to kind of put this in context, the models that we have from Games Workshop that are coming out, actually they're on pre-order this week, represent those which only go to war. However, there are more than that, and we're going to dive into those really quickly because they're only given slight mention. Uh, there are the Embalors, which are, we covered those in the Achillean video, where these people, their magic is devoted to breaking the minds of animals and beasts that they tame them. We briefly discussed how Stormcast Eternals and Fire Slayers build these strong emotional bonds with their creatures, but the Deepkin have to literally break the minds and enslave animals to get them to work with them. Another issue we don't see very much of is the Soul Warden, and these guys are responsible for kind of guiding the race, more like a political figurehead. There are a lot of responsibility, almost like overseers, if you will, but they fit in a society in a very important role, and that is they have the kind of mage sight to look at a soul and see if it's a withering or not. They also kind of establish what cast a newborn infant is going to fit into. And the last one briefly mentioned is the Coralis. Now these are the ones who use magic and prayer to manipulate living material into making buildings. So some deep kin will manipulate shell and create like structures and, and fortifications with that. Many of them use coral, and it's just that act of building with natural materials. But they use magic to make it grow in such a way to fit their needs. And these are the people who make society possible. They build houses and fortifications, they produce weapons and vehicles, they act as your doctors, priests, politicians, engineers. They're really the heart and soul of any kind of society. And as we kind of expand our scope to include the ones that go to war, there is no ether sea without them, so even their underwater life and bringing that kind of power to land isn't possible without the Asharans. So those are the ones we don't really see on the tabletop. They're, like I said, given brief mentions, but now let's transition into the ones that we can play as. Starting off with the Tide Casters. Now these guys are by far, I think, the most important to the faction. As a whole, they are the MVPs of the entire thing, and those are going to be the people who project the Aether Sea. They allow the forces of the Deepkin to come on land for raids, but they also do the Aether Sea underwater, meaning everyone can breathe under there. And what sets them apart from other kind of magic, wizards, things like that, is they really seem to be developers of magic. A lot of the other factions, like they found some ancient tomb and they kind of, you know, studied and practiced this thing. But what we see with the Deepkin is they've developed several new kinds of magic. And this is going to be the kind of Isharan that develops those things. It's really the only faction in Age of Sigmar that has a research and development department, if you will. And what's fascinating is they have this ability, and it's just kind of touched on in the Battle Tome loosely, where uh, when we were talking in the first video, that Teclis sees some darkness in all of his creations, like all these dudes have some part of them that's kind of blackened by their time with Slaanesh. The Tidecasters see that as well in themselves, and they can actually channel that and push it onto their enemies. And what this does is it fills them with despair. And so when we see them act in a raid, right, where we talked about how they do war, the enemy is like full of fear and pandemonium and everything's nuts and they see more monsters than are there. It's all hallucinations and meant to shake them up. This is what the tide casters are doing. They're projecting whatever horrific things happen to them onto their enemies while also simultaneously projecting the ether sea to let the army move on land. Uh, next is going to be the soul renders. Now, these are the guys who kind of look like human anglerfish. And these guys are the most valuable player when it comes to a raid. As far as the Sharans go, they are highly unusual in the sense that they are actually trained to fight by Achilleans. It's the only kind of the scholarly classes that are taught to fight by the warrior cast. And in such, they kind of fall in sort of a dual role. Their main responsibility is for collecting the souls of those who fall in combat, ally and enemy. A raid is a success or a failure based on how well they do their job. It takes a lot of education, not just martial prowess from the Achilleans, but education in how to collect souls, how to store them, and then kind of put them into a body. And as such, they can actually resurrect fallen Namardi in battle around them. The second they feel that kind of soul slipping away, they snatch it midair and throw it right back in the body. In addition to that, they actually act as a battery. So as the raid is going on, people are dying, souls are flying everywhere. They're just scooping them up, kind of like having a vacuum in the air, right? Just sucking them up there. And uh, they take them back to the Enclave and share them with the Soul Wardens to put them in infants. So there is a point in time where they just have a ton of this resource. Now to make his role a success, it puts him in a very dangerous place. Remember, he's a scholar, he's an educated man, uh, knows how to fight, but he's not exceptional, and he's not hardcore trained to be like a soul fighting force or anything like that. But to do his job effectively, he has to be up front near combat where all the souls are departing. People are dying. 
And one thing that I want to add, add on a note here is that I love the fact that he does the job that nobody wants to talk about. For having this incredibly noble race that thinks that they are somehow better than everyone else, the kind of air of superiority that elves have, and as much as they want to look good, his role exists in every form to meet the needs that the, kind of the brokenness of their society has. If they weren't so utterly devastated by, by their creation process, his role would not exist. And that's huge. And we have to wonder what kind of society pressures or opinions that puts on these guys in every enclave. I can't imagine it's held in very high regard as a role. And next one I want to talk about is the Soul Scryers. Now these guys operate as both a priest and a navigator. In a sense of being a priest, he has some measure of supernatural ability. He can perceive souls at an incredible distance. Uh, he picks the best targets that he can see kind of with his ethereal eye, if you will. And then as a navigator, he has a device called a CFAR compass, which he can use to navigate the whirlways. Basically, he finds the targets, charts the course, and then the raid happens. So if we're talking about planning phases of, of who's important, these guys are incredibly important. What's cool is they can find targets even that are hundreds of miles inland. And using the whirlways and ether sea, they're able to pop up pretty much wherever they want. Not a whole lot of lore on this guy, uh, but he is very cool and he's very cool in the game. And the last character I want to touch on is Lotan, Warden of the Soul Ledgers. He is one of two characters in the entire army. And uh, he actually represents one of the roles that we talked about at the top of the video, which is the Soul Warden. Now I said these guys don't go to battle. Well, that's because Soul Wardens typically don't. In fact, there's only one that does, and his name is Lotan, Warden of the Soul Ledgers. And this guy, he is the most cool accountant in all of the mortal realms, which is exactly as cool as that kind of made it sound, right? I mean, he, he's an accountant. That's what he does. So basically, he does the math. He goes around to every enclave. So he, he is from the Iron Rack, but he doesn't actually just strictly work with them, unlike Volturnus. This guy will go to every enclave and fight with them, and he does math. How many people did we lose doing this raid? How many souls did we take? When we took those souls back to our enclave, how did we use that resource? How many were used by the Corallus to expand the enclave structures? How many were put into Namarty to keep the civilization served and moving forward? How many do we need to expand? Were the losses acceptable? All those things, all the analytics that go into having exactly one necessary resource, right? But then you get into some cool stuff where the uh, Deepkin, they experiment with different races all the time, meaning they'll take human souls. They have, uh, there was a small bit here where like daughters of Cain think that they prey upon them. So, okay, there's other elven souls. Okay, that's a problem. Oryx souls, Sylvaneth, Dwarden. Are all these things worth the same? I kind of wonder because if your currency is the soul, and we know that not every race is the same, can he kind of project and determine the success of a raid based on how many he gets of which? Those kinds of things. Like those very lofty, like I said, he's an accountant. That's what he does. He's kind of lofty, kind of analytical things. But when you're trying to struggle to survive, the guy who can make the most sense of that is incredibly important. And his sheer presence kind of invigorates Namardi because now, now they know that their short, brutal lives are going somewhere because this guy's going to get stuff straight. He's going to whip the Achillians in line, make sure they're doing their job right so that their sacrifice is not in vain. As such, Namardi really loved being around him. In game terms, they get a little buff from being around him. And his sheer presence, like his exudes magic, he's not really a wizard, but his sheer presence sustains the ether sea around him so he can actually go off in combat and do whatever he wants and it'll stay kind of hovering around him which is awesome now it should be noted he's probably the single weakest hero in this army he's he's like i said he's got an accountant stat line which is not a stat line we've seen i think the closest thing is like a necromancer he fights like a mathematician but luckily he's got a buddy on his back and this is kind of the most popular thing about this model and he is the octar familiar basically the giant octopus who looks like he just rolled out of a bar fight and he's a really spectacular model now really briefly why is this cast really cool well here's the thing we need to establish the importance of them okay the other two casts exist to support the other two casts exist to defend and support this one they are the stuff that societies are made of and it's not a superiority thing they don't carry this aura of being better than the other deepkin but we're all on the same page the the race has to survive and that we want it to prosper we want to find the cure to this soul problem well if anyone's going to solve that problem it's going to be these guys it's going to be that cast and so the namari are happy to serve them to make sure that they can do their research the achillians are happy to defend them as well as bring back test subjects to make sure everything's going well but again these are the guys who make 
their lifestyle underwater are possible. They make travel possible. They're the builders, the architects, the doctors. I can't stress that enough that this is all the things when we think about a society, we think about technological advancements, the way we do life. That is what these guys bring to the enclaves. And I love the fact that in these books, it doesn't produce arrogance. There's never really a story of a Isharon being super uppity and putting down an Achillean or anything like that. I'm sure there's still strife. But on the whole, it produces resolve. Instead of saying, the Namardi are less than I am, and they are subject to me, they see the sacrifices that their brothers and sisters who are sick and broken make, and are, are strengthened to do what they need to do. I've got to figure this problem out. And on another note, I do think that when Teclis kind of in his mind designed the Deepkin. He made them in the High Elf image from Warhammer Fantasy Battles, which is true, it's what the Battle Tome says. But these guys are the closest thing to that. Like as a cast, they are the great thinkers, the architects, the wizards, the poets, all the kind of loftier high things that the High Elves enjoyed. That's what these guys are. And to put a big point on it, it's what the Namarti were supposed to be. And as such, they represent the greatest hope that this race has. However, they also represent the terrible extents to which they have to go to survive. You gotta keep in mind, the research that they're doing to find a cure involves a lot of soul theft and a lot of harvesting. You're ticking off Nagash, you're really hurting people, you are you are really testing your allies when you start taking humans and Daughters of Cain and those kinds of things. You can really make yourself an enemy. How many people went insane from the fear spell that they were trying to project? What about the memory wiping magic? How many people did that backfire on their head just exploded? I mean, there's some seriously dark stuff here. And what I love the fact that this cast in particular really captures that duality of they are the best of them, but they exist to hide the flaws from the worst of them. So folks, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on the Asharans. I thank you so much for hanging with me as we finish up Deep King Week. I have one more video and that's going to be on the Ether Sea, and I will see you tomorrow morning for that. Thank you so much for watching and happy wargaming. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed that video and I want to introduce you to some awesome folks. These are my patrons over on Patreon and they make this show possible by their direct support of me to buy battle tomes and black library books and all the material I need and the hardware support that I need to make this stuff possible. And if you'd like to join them, go ahead and click over to the Patreon page to the link in the description down below and you'll be introduced to a really awesome community of people talking about the hobby, sharing what they're painting. Uh, I invite them uh, to be part of polls to decide what content comes next. I raffle off every battle tome that I review and we're having some great fun and discussions over there. So go ahead and check it out. Now, if you can't support in that way, that's completely fine. I'm just so glad that you watched this video here today. And if you have an Age of Sigmar lore question, go ahead and click subscribe and leave it in the comments down below. I read every single question and comment. I respond to as many as I possibly can, but I use them all as inspiration for future videos. So go ahead and do that now. And I look forward to seeing you guys on my next Age of Sigmar lore video. Thank you so much for watching, and happy wargaming.